will also be reducing my size of my screen so I won't be able to see myself when I'm talking to yourselves. So welcome to the day. Um, we're hopefully going to keep this to about an hour, hour and a half if we absolutely have to. Um, it depends how many questions people have or if it's something that sort of somebody wants to discuss um, near the end that we, we need to sort of take a little bit of time with. And try and take a reasonably easy approach, um, stress-free as possible for everybody so that um, nobody has to be worrying about anything. Um, so we try and keep it pretty relaxed and easy. And if you have any questions, drop it in the chat function and we can take it from there at the time. But first, um, I need to have a quick word from our sponsors. So first of all, this is a Work Matters related webinar. So it's been organized by Leitrim Library Service. I uh, don't know if you're aware of it. I know there's some library team members on the line as well. Um, but Work Matters at the Library is an initiative supporting business, startups, job seeking, our career changing. So this has been run as part of this approach. So basically, um, you know, the library has a lot of different options you can use um, from your library uh, um, app. So I'm going to send out a quick details on that now. You can find a lot of information um, from your library card. So if you don't have a library card, that's not a problem. It can be very easy to sign up for one. You just log on to Leitrim Library Services at Leitrim County Council .ie, so leetrumcoco.ie, ENG, Community Culture Library Join, uh, which is easy enough. I'm sure you've all remembered it right now. And, um, you know, you'll be able to get a temporary card and PIN, and I've also popped the link in there and you get a copy at the end. And then with that, you can sort of choose ebooks, audiobooks, on bar books, and also the connection of business books and things that might help you as well in future. And you can basically... Um, you can sort of read the sort of latest health and fitness magazines as well if you use the RBD, sorry, RB digital and press reader systems. Uh, as well as that, um, you know, you also can sort of take some online courses um, to the library, which are universal class ones, like some marks of applications, Word, Excel, Windows 10. And you can find all these details on the portal by clicking on the online library services. So that's on uh, Leitrim County Council, in ENG, Community Culture Library, your online library. Ever memorize that? Yeah, okay, I'll pop it back in the pop it back in there for you as well. Uh, and if you do need any help, there's a local phone number 071-9655-482 or email Leachman Library at leachmancoco.ie. And uh, I've popped all that into the uh, online chat for you so you can have a look at it later on if you need it. Um, because it is quite a handy uh, resource to have locally on your doorstep and it is free at point of use, which is great. Um, I remember when I was first starting out my career, libraries were a godsend, and they still are. Just, uh... but without further ado, <clears throat> we're now going to get on to the main event for the game. Next hour or so is we're going to cover a few areas about sort of job in, uh, hunting, interview tips and techniques. Okay, so because I sort of I like helping people out, and it's something I'm enthusiastic about, I can sometimes start talking a little bit too fast. So if I am just wave tell me to shut up slow down stick up a, your hand or whatever you need to do and um, drop it in the chat and i'll try and do it so up front try and make it as easy as possible for you have no problem letting me know that if you need to the first step is going to be trying to decide which positions or jobs you want to go for which is an important one and one that gets missed sometimes because there's usually pressing or other reasons at the top of someone's mind but it, you often find you get into a little bit of grief if you um, are going for the wrong job for the wrong reason. And it's a cultural thing, I think, in Ireland where you are, are sort of encouraged to get a job, to have a job and not really worry about what the job is. So just a little bit on that first. Then we're going to go on to preparing for the interview. Um, a quick word on online interviews, which is happening a lot more at the moment. And then a suggested approach to the interview and then a suggested after interview checklist. So. <clears throat> Basically, um, learning stuff for the sake of learning stuff is great. And I completely get that. I'm a learning geek. I like learning stuff and I like knowing things. But being aware and knowing something and not actually sharing with people or using it is a bit of a selfish act and a waste. So um, what I would ask everyone to do from this sort of get the most out of it is look through everything. Um, and then if it's something that resonates with you that you think you're missing or that will make a difference for you, Take that and work on that. Um, there's no point in trying everything we're going to go through for the very first interview you're going to go for after this. 
And then if you don't get that job at the next one, you don't try anything or, or you start not trying any of the approaches or leaving one or two out, it's best that you take, take one or two things that you'll work with and you'll keep consistently using from there, okay? And you'll have access to the replay of this. You'll have access at the end of this talk to the um, handouts, which will have some worksheets for you to use. So take what will work for you. And if there's something that we don't think will work yet for you, leave it be and go from there. Um, also, if it's a case that you're somebody who's on the call who this will be one of your first roles you're going for, um, or it's a case that you're not currently in employment and looking for a job is your job, for want of a better word, then you can take everything and use this sort of process to make things easier. But for everybody else, if you're already working every single minute of the day you have and you don't have any free time, you know, doing a lot of these things might be a bit tricky. So in those cases, what I'd ask you to do is just look at the start of it, deciding the job, and at the end with the checklist, and we'll take it from there. Is that all right? So no pressure, take what you like from it, and we'll go for the rest. So next one is, well, which role you want to go for and why? So essentially, deciding which position you're going to go for or what job you're going to go for is great, but you have to be able to understand why you're going for this particular job. So this is the first thing I ask sort of people to do is when a job comes along that you're going to apply for, you need to understand why you're going for it. So and the best way is to have a little piece of paper down the middle of the line and across top you have your honest reason and your, for want of a better word, diplomatic reason as to why you're going for it. So for example, the honest reason might be you want to pay rise or it might be that you are in an organization that's siloed and structured. So the only way you can progress is getting an expanding up or an next role, et cetera. So that can be the honest reason why. And the diplomatic reason obviously then is how you can rephrase that to uh, sort of, you know, come across better in an interview if you want sort of career progression, et cetera. Um, but if it's a case that you're starting off in your career and you, know, you just need a job to start getting something on your CV, that's the honest reason, that's fine. So, you know, you can rephrase that from a diplomatic point of view afterwards, but you need to be honest with yourself. Why are you going for a position? And also, once you understand why you want it, what you expect from it. And also to be important, this even before you even apply or decide to apply for it, is if you got it, at what stage would you plan on leaving that position? Even if you're just scanning the scanning the um the job ads, and you know the reason is is that you need to understand. Sometimes people can go for a position in a job, and the worst thing that happens is they get the job, and then suddenly they're there ten years later or so, going, "Oh God, I'm still stuck here," and they've made a, you know, not they end up in a situation that they're not where they would have envisaged themselves being down the line had they stopped and spent a little bit of time thinking about it. So by knowing why you want to go for a job and why you want to go for this specific job helps you choose which ones you go for. Um, for example, with ourselves in um, in our cats business, for example, we oftentimes get sort of job letters and applications like you just see it's copy and pasted and they're sending it out all the practices and they don't really put much you know thought into it or whatever. And you just usually they go straight into the bin and you don't even bother looking at them. Um, but you'll know when somebody has actually thought about why they want that job. That'll help you write the cover letter you're going to be sending over easier at the end. And it can be tricky if you are in a situation that without any prior knowledge or warning, you find yourself suddenly needing a role because, you know, you've either lost your job in short notice, um, you've been made redundant or something's happened and it happens, does happen, happens quite a lot. Sometimes you need to simply just get a specific role anywhere because you need to get a job and that's fine it happens but if you're in the, have the luxury of currently having a role and you're making a planned move make sure that you put a lot of effort into working out which job you want to go for and why and also as well you have to work out exactly why does the job suit you and will it suit you now so for example um if you have a case that you are in a stage of life that 
is transitory. So like maybe you're getting married or you've got just recently got married or you've moved town or you've gone from finishing university or school into the workforce. You're in a transitional period. So what might be ideal for you now or would have been ideal for you in the past may not be exactly what you need in maybe a year or two's time. So it's always good to try and understand what you want, what type of workplace you want, what type of the place that you're applying to is, and what type of hours. So, you know, there's also as well to be aware of, is there no-go areas that you will not want to look at? So there's a real need to um, try and balance the urgency of, I need to get a role, and I need to earn money, with I need to make sure I get the role I want. Um, there's an adage that you may have been told by sort of parents or grandparents over the years, you know, it's easier to get a job when you have a job. Um, and that sort of you know, re encourages the approach of jump at the first thing you get and then look from there. The reality is if you do that approach, you are, especially in today's more interconnected world, probably doing yourself a disservice if it's in an area you want to grow in. So, for example... If you jump into a position that you need to leave in a few months because you made the wrong choice, that's disruptive to yourself and disruptive to the place that you're leaving. And you're going to have to look for them for a reference or some form of hopefully nice word or explanation as to why they've left. And because if you're especially looking at Ireland, it's a small country. If you've qualified in an area, I will guarantee you that the clinical area or professional area you're dealing with is reasonably short as well. So it's very likely the person you're applying for with your dream job may be acquaintances or, or be professional colleagues to some shape or form with the place where you're just leaving from. And regardless of whether you have them listed on your CV or not, as a reference, they'll pick up the phone or drop an email and say, what do you think of this person? Why are they going over? So it can, it does come back and bite. So it's good. It is easier to make a jump when you have a job already because you don't have to worry about putting a roof over your head and putting food on the table. That said, if you are in a situation you have to get a role, make sure it's a role you're able to look at to try and think about. And essentially, the, the way I'd ask that question is, if you are going for a job that's a stopgap position, could you live with it if you have to stay there long term? So have a think about that because um, it does happen and you will know sometimes when somebody's job hopper you look at their CV and it says like there's been three months here, six months there, a year there, two years there. And it's like, oh, you know, and then it doesn't matter what they're saying to you. They're talking to you and say, well, I really want to find a place to settle down and have sort of a long term job, my forever job. And just want to go for and You know, I really want to work for this company. And it's great. It doesn't matter. It's not what they say. It's what you do. So it's to be aware of the fact that you know you can get, get away with it maybe once or twice and especially if you're starting off in your career and need to get a few bits under your belt of experience it's doable but as the more you go on you need to see nice chunks of longevity um so for example i've had somebody um a while ago um sort of come to me it was actually from a library service who was saying you know this is this job going in this library and it's great can you help me you just prepare for it so, fine and the reason why they wanted to go for the job was because it was a senior librarian job but it was not in a very well populated part of the country and the job had been open for about 12 months just 11 12 months and um they'd had a lot of people they offered it to but they never turned it down so you know they've been had the conversation with her there it was a case of well why do you think you know they're having so much difficulty filling this role and you know is it a case that you know they'll be happy if you go there from metropolitan area of Dublin to a very remote area for the first time and um, you know are you happy enough if you find yourself there in 2030 you know and you know she never actually had a thought she had to take some time thinking about it and you know obviously in her case discussed with husband etc because that is a big it's, it's not just you it's if it's a family you, they have to move as well so um, you know had to think about it and then sort of you know was able to reset the expectations of what they wanted to go for and then obviously yeah, she got it in the end and that was happy enough for her but at least she had a chance to take a thing and say yes this is what i would like and here's why and you know so if it's a case that you're going to go for stopgap always ask can you live with it you had to stay there short term um i remember years ago when i was in um it sales i 
um, left a multinational and I had to take a short job because I didn't like the pay basically um, with a company called IBM and I said I'll join this now for a few months and be grand 15 years later I was still there going oh god what happened you know it happens the best one in the world but at least it was okay to stay there and I enjoyed it which was luck not design pure luck so from when you're trying to make a position and make a jump always ask if you have to stay there long term can you if you can't let it go don't go for it don't apply for it which brings us to the application time so first things first google is your best friend so um before you do any thing like even apply or click send or send anything off to do uh, for a job just make sure you do a little bit of research on the background of the company before you apply for it this has to be simple enough don't need to do loads and loads of things just get an idea of the size who the owners are or the, if it's a branch in an organization who the branch managers are look up facebook linkedin etc also if it's a industry you've worked in for a while just make sure that maybe you know do you know anybody else who's working there what's it like to work with if you like the culture etc um it may seem like a waste of time for each application but it'll do a couple of things one it'll mean you'll be applying for less so it'll be more targeted it'll improve the quality of the ones you apply for but it helps you write the cover letter because then you've worked out why you want the job already and you've answered the questions before you checked out what it's like if you were successful and you think yeah i'd be happy enough to go for this and it helps you create a better impression when you start off from it so for example, um, you know, if it's a case that you have to go for a position and it's a place that you, you know, you'd like the idea of it, but you don't actually sort of like the culture, et cetera, what you're basically doing is you're setting yourself up for a certain amount of failure because you will spend most of your working uh, days, I'm sorry, your, your sort of waking day at work, usually five days a week or so, or in shifts. And if it's a place that you don't feel happy in, and you knowing to go into that, it's not a very clever move in the short term or long term for anybody down the line. But people do it because they think I'll get this for a while and then I'll jump on somewhere else, either intercompany or whatever. And that if that's part of your plan and you're happy with it, that's okay. But just be aware that you try and understand a little bit about how the culture works because that's quite important because that's essentially your day to day organization. And the there is an, again i hate with these phrases these but here it is um there's the phrase that people join companies but leave managers okay and it is does ring true a little bit because the immediate people you work with will have the biggest impact on how well you are to each day at work so that's the immediate boss your supervisor your work colleagues etc systems processes etc are helpful and they can be good but if you have a good team of people you work with, you can overcome most of that. Even if that is just laughing and sort of complaining about how bad the systems are at the end of each day. If you have a good group and you have a good squad with you, it works very well. If you don't, it doesn't work well. So if you can get a feel from looking through and lurking around a bit uh, about what's out on social media from people who work there, you might get a good idea as to what it's like. And this is the key part if you're starting off um, on your career or if you are not currently having a job and you are um, sort of full-time looking for a job as your job, make it a process. So if you're applying for lots of positions, you need to take this level of quality research, looking into things, fine tuning it and making targeted applications and do it almost like a factory type process fast. So I'm not saying you've got to spend hours and hours and hours researching the favorite, the name of the, the CEO's favorite cat and sort of that level of detail on every single application. You need to be able to get as much information as you need to make good judgment as to whether there's a place you'd like to work if you've got the role and do it frequently and repeat it. So you do it by making it a process. So here's a suggested way of doing it. This will be in the handbook at the end as well. Um, if you think it'll work for you, great. If you think it won't, that's absolutely fine as well. Everyone's different. But you do need to be able to replicate things and I'll explain to you why this works quite well as a way to do it. First of all, all you need is a computer or a laptop and open three folders. So the first folder is called possible openings. Okay. So the second, that's really anything you see, you read, hear about, that's either upcoming positions or whatever. 
it's possible openings that you might be interested in you pop in there so for example um i saw on the paper this um this morning online paper nobody sort of really reads this little papers much these days but um i saw that uh, intel for example is taking on 1600 people in the next few years in kildare in leakslip great <clears throat> if i was in the market for that sort of role mental note in it goes there most importantly goes into the system into possible openings so i can keep an eye out for that because sometimes you will see stuff that may be of interest and then by the time they put the ad out you might have missed it you might have not been focused on it or not aware of it so it helps you go back and refresh to check this was something coming up i was interested in have they launched it yet or have they announced it yet and that means when you do put the word out amongst family or friends that you're looking for a role you know and you explain to them what sort of thing you're looking for if somebody's talking to somebody else or you know a, a relative is looking at the you know internet or uh, the paper and sees that there's something coming up that could be of use in a few months time they let you know about it you don't have to think about it just grab it pop it in there take a picture on your camera or whatever uh, your camera phone and pop it in it's just a dump of all the places that might be coming up of possible positions you want to go for next one is open applications so basically it's unlikely that you're going to be going for various types of jobs okay most likely the vast majority of people will be going for a single type of position so you would be going for a brain surgeon role with one application then an airline pilot the next and then a tractor mechanic the next you're going to probably go for a sort of single type of area either in your cross skill set so if you are in sales or uh, marketing or IT is your skill set and you will go for any industry in this area or you could be somebody who's a specialist in a industry and that you're like a retail uh, manager and you want any job as a manager in a retail store so you know whatever type of approach it is generally it's going to be all in the same area so you'll be able to make a quick decision as to which ones you want to go for after time but the thing is when they're all similar they can blur into one so when you do put an application in for a job you create a little subfolder in the one called open applications okay and you put in everything you send them oops so for example um if you have um sent off a nice detailed cover letter and a cv especially if you tweak your cv based on the industry or the job you go the job you're going for which is quite a good little tip sometimes you then have a complete carbon copy of everything that they've got um same thing if you're submitting an online application because sometimes online application systems will force you to put things in in set formats then you just take a quick screenshot of each page as you fill it in and pop it in there one of the reasons is that sometimes somebody's um i've been sitting to interview somebody and they've had a cv and looking at it going, mm, it's very good and then they have a copy of their cv but it's a different copy because they've had so many versions of their cv they've been sending out to different places they've lost track of what they said to what you know so it's just important that you know exactly that you can review what you've sent if you get called for interview so you know exactly what they have on and how you've sent it and then rejected this is probably the most important one from a um perfecting and getting a role point of view if you get a no or if you get a call for interview and you don't get the job um or if you don't hear from somebody after applying for about say three months later you pop them in here and you sort of again divide them to those where you were interviewed and you were told no those where you just didn't get the job and there was no response and even if you got a response like a please go away letter sometimes they will say why they reject you other times they give you a flat one or two line answer just pop it in there as well so you can see what the trends are basically this is the folder you're going to go to and check on after you've done interviews to see exactly what went well what didn't go well so the www then slash tala is basically what went well and what to take a look at so it's not saying bad or good it's on the day what you felt went well or what you felt didn't go so well and that's down to your impression and sometimes it'll correlate and you'll see that there's trends coming up where you're making it or you're having an issue and you need to be careful of it so that's the structure which i'd suggest as a one that works quite well for making a process out of targeting applications for roles so what we have to do here well essentially it's if you're doing a process you need to focus on the details so for example um a very simple one is 
if you're sending out lots of applications, you may just might have set yourself a target. If this is your full time job, is trying to find a job, you could spend your days sort of scanning job ads, trying to see what's out there, and you're sending off multiple CVs. And if you into um, and cover letters, you need to focus on the details. So, for example, I don't want to see if I'm basically a branch manager in the Tesco branch, and I see a nice cover letter come through from somebody who says I'd love to work in Super Value. You know, it just doesn't help set the right expectation and the right impression. Uh, likewise, um, if you're supplying to smaller businesses or smaller organizations, doubly so, because they will most likely be owner managers. They probably would have bet their farm on trying to make the business work and that their livelihood invested in the, in the thing. So if they can't trust you to get their business name right, or in some cases, the name of the person right, how can you trust them in anything else? Like my wife, for example, who's the clinical director for CATS, gets loads of CVs saying Mr. Marika Morris, yet her picture's up there on the website and you know, addresses to Mrs. Marika Morris. They still go Mr. and off the go. It just leaves bad impression, and usually they go, those go straight into the bin. So just be careful. If you are making a regular process of trying to apply for jobs, always make sure you focus on the details. And that helps by setting yourself a target of, say, two or three a day or whatever if you're sending it out. I know some online systems will allow you to sort of select jobs and filter them, and then you have your set template letter and you go apply all. It's fine, but it's a bit of a waste. And um, end of the day, most people can see those coming, to be honest. So if it's something you, you're interested in as a job you really want, put the time in to apply it correctly. Okay, so and again, focusing on details. Um, it's important, and that helps helps when you're trying to prepare for the interview. So I'm going to cover a few steps next about what you do in advance and on the actual day. But before we go any further, everyone just give me a thumbs up or a question mark or just ask me a question or anything about what we've covered so far about how you make it a process. Um, is that clear enough for everybody? You don't have to use the exact same method, but the key takeaways are don't go for every job just because you think it might work for you. On uh, you know, even if you do find yourself currently in a position where you need to move fast, just be careful of getting trapped in somewhere you don't won't be happy. Secondly, be careful when you're sending off applications that you know exactly what you sent off and you have a copy of it, and that you don't make silly little mistakes that happen a lot, like getting somebody's name wrong, getting the name of the organization wrong, etc. It if, especially if there's a lot of um, applications coming through, it doesn't doesn't work very well. And um, it probably goes without saying, but you spell check. It's a uh, problem if you've um, sent through some uh, CVs or applications or cover letters and the spellings are wrong. A caveat to that, which um, has worked in the past for people I've um, spoken with, um, is if English is not your natural first language, state that and make a little apology or something at the end. Uh, you know, if you, if it's the case, so state that you know your primary language is Spanish. Um, or French or whatever, and you know that you know, that's English, so you can conduct, so you, especially if it's the case that you are able to converse well, but you might make the little mistake or so with emails back and forth. You know, when you do have the chance to mention it, apologize for it and explain it. Okay. Um, but if you can spell check, make sure everything goes through correctly. And the reason there, if anybody who's bilingual on the call, you know that you, know, you usually have to switch off spell check if you're writing in multiple languages on computer systems because it'll focus on English and then give you incorrect spelling for everything else and you won't get anything written. So um, that's why most people who will be using two languages or more will have spell checks switched off usually. So that's how it can happen. So preparing for the interview. So you go to your open applications first. And in advance of your interview, you go back to the folder and see uh, on your um, laptop. This is handy if you have a short time to from where you've heard of something coming up to where you have to go for the interview so sometimes you might you have the luxury of like a, a week or two other times it may be a case that you might get a short notice and that can you come in tomorrow or two days time or so um or life happens you might have this pencil into your calendar for a couple of weeks in advance and guess what you're actually you're working, you're doing stuff, you're studying, whatever it might be, and you don't actually have time to put your head around what to do onto there so beforehand. It happens. That's where the preparation before having an open application folder will be useful. So 
Here, you know, the all information you would have found before, oops, sorry, that's the wrong button there. Um, all the information and research you've done before should be in here and I'll have a chance to look through. Then it's good to check any social media or blogs for the last few week, last week or two to see what's important to the organization right now. And then obviously if, you can if you've been given the name of the people who are doing the interviews, great. Um, if it's a case that it's a long it's a number of roles or it's a long interview application, um, sometimes you'll see on um, the Twitter feeds, usually people say a little picture of like empty desk and a cup of coffee and a smiley face saying, oh, another round of interviews. You know, oh dear, hope we find somebody, lol, whatever. You know, at least you have to name the person, one of the people who's doing the interviews or something. So people are interesting when it comes to what they post on social media. So it's always worth a quick check um, a day or so beforehand. Um, if you can try and put a face to the name, if you don't know who it is, it can just at least help with your nerves if at all possible. Um, Google again is your best friend and so can Facebook searching be, you know, they'll have a certain amount of use to help with, but if you don't find stuff straight away, like within about 10 minutes or so, don't keep rooting around and just drive yourself crazy. Um, ascent is as well when you're preparing, try and prepare some questions that you might have that you think will usually arise for you. So, you know, you can also as well have questions that you're used to answering when you've gone for jobs like this before. But what I ask you to focus on really is think of the ones that you've had real difficulty with in the past, like the ones that you, you know, really would be concerned about if they ask you any horrible questions. Like, are these are the ones you'd really, really, really would rather they don't ask. And use the line in the sheet approach. Okay, so for example, if you've got gaps in your CV, or if there's something that you have a concern about, if they ask, write it out and then try and see, can you come up with the honest answer, diplomatic answer to the question, okay? Uh, and if it's a really bad black spot that, you know, for whatever reason at the time, it just doesn't look good and there's no way around it, you own it and then explain what's happened or how you've changed since then or what's grown. There's no point in trying to rejig around things. Um, just as easy as you can sort of Google somebody or do some sort of background researching on somebody uh, who's interviewing you, the interviewers can do the same for yourself. So it's highly likely that if they're competent interviewers anyway, they've done a bit of check on social media to see exactly what you've been posting, what you've been saying. Because you basically, when you're going on to social media, in any one of the forms, you are publishing. You don't have an editor sitting there screaming at you or checking everything before it goes out, which is the bad thing, but you're essentially publishing. You're giving the right that anybody else in the world can go and search for it. Even if you will have something that you think has been sort of semi-private or shared in a small group message. If you do a Google search uh, or you do the right type of search, you can search some of the web archive systems that will show what you may have thought was hidden a year or two ago from ever. So just be careful in the fact that, you know, you can check on other people and see you know, who they are. They can also check for you. So the main thing there is if you have something on your CV that can come up that you would rather not mention, either leave it off and talk around it or have it there, but be prepared to address it and essentially own the response, okay? And then also as well, try to make sure you've, uh, you've written out some basic questions about, you know, what do we like to work for the organization, et cetera. It shows you're interested in, you know, and you can see yourself in that organization in the future. Now, this is really around what you may be find out from the company and what's interested of them right there and then. Um, one of the things that could be of use is um, there is a, Again, I'm going to use a library example, okay, <laughs> because I noticed some people from the library on. Um, there was somebody who was going for a position who, um, you know, didn't really know or have, wasn't really able to articulate much, you know, why they thought they'd be able for a role they're going for. And it's not like an offer here. So, again, they done some digging and sort of what that library was doing, that that branch was doing, and then realized that, you know, they didn't do anything like sort of talks very much. And that they were the person who was, in, who was linking up with various speakers, including myself, to do talks for the library they were in currently. So I said, well, that's something you, from what you can see, they have no evidence of doing very much. Go with that. You know, maybe that's something that would be important to them, but they haven't thought about. So immediately you're bringing value. So sometimes checking a little bit before you go in as to what's happening currently in the last, as I said, few weeks or a couple of months with an organization or that branch or that division, from whatever you can find, Will be useful to try and hit some hot buttons that you might get with the people you're talking to. And the next important thing is to read your CV. 
um, know every single bit of your CV. Um, if you do change items on your CV, based on whatever role, go to it and make sure you've reread the CV you've sent through. Um, and if there's something in your CV, be prepared to discuss it. Um, like I have a habit of asking annoying questions sometimes, um, just because it's a uh, it's annoying to the person if not prepared. Um, sometimes I'll ask somebody, you know, you know, why is you know mountain climbing down is one of your hobbies? Which how many mountains have you climbed? And they say you look at me blankly and go, what? Well, you know, you've got your hobbies of reading, mountain climbing, you know, surfboarding. Oh yeah, yeah. So no, I climbed the Sugarloaf Mountain once when I was in secondary school for a day trip. Okay, that's not mountain. That's not mountain climbing. It's a hobby. You've done it once. Leave it off. Okay. So if you have put something down, make sure you're aware of it and you can talk about it. Um, it's you can be doing great, and then you basically get caught up with something silly or as simple as hobbies because you've made up some hobbies to look good, and you're sort of forced to admit it in the middle of an interview. Uh, what that tells the person on the other side is that, you know, when push comes to shove, you're going to fluff it rather than actually try and be creative or articulate around it. So be careful when you're preparing that for your CV. So how do you how do you come around that and fill out your CV and make it look cool so that you actually will sort of come across very well in interviews and you can actually talk richly around it? Well, it's basically down to stories. And the whole next piece and the bulk of what we're going to go over to now is about stories. And the thing about stories is that humans um, evolved and civilization evolved around stories. And people remember stories. And when you may be one of maybe, say, 10, 15, 20 people who go for interviews over the course of a long day for some interviewers, OK, they're going at the end have everything to one. I might have a little scorecard or check sheets, etc. That'll show what people look at. But for some of those people, there's going to be a story or two that'll stand out in their minds that say, oh yeah, that was that person who said they done this, etc. It's a way to stand out from somebody else. So here's some facts that might be helpful to you. There's only one you. All right. So depending on your skills, your experience or your lack of experience, the one thing that you have that nobody else does is being you. So what you do is starting point, you go through your CV and focus on reflect on your previous roles. Or if you're in school and this is your first job you're going for, you're going for a summer job or it's a post university type role. You know, you go through things you've done either in your work, i.e. school or university or in volunteer or sports teams, etc. Okay. And you think. So this is a again, uh, this is in the handbook, and there's a blank copy you can look at as well for that. But essentially, this helps you come up with little anecdotes or stories, ideally, sort of 30 second to one minute, two minute snippets that they show why you are flipping awesome. You always use the wrong word there. But <clears throat> essentially, this is going to help you stand out. So you need to get a piece of paper for each role and you got to focus only on a specific situation. And it's going to be something that you know, you've done that nobody else has done. Um, like sometimes when I'm um, discussing with people um, and say, well, you know, why, you know, what's what's so great that you can actually bring to this organization or where you're going for the role? And say, oh, I was on the team that first developed the blah. Great. We did you lead the team? No. Then you cannot claim credit as being on the team. The person who lead the team can say, rightly or wrongly, they led the team that developed blah. What did you do on the team? Were you the person who discovered it? Were you the person who pressed the button? Were you the person who built the widget that made the blah, whatever it might be, go? What did you do on the team? Because theoretically speaking, and non-judgmentally, the person who made the cup of coffee to keep the team fueled for the morning, but this is a member of the team and contributed to the success of making the whatever as the person who sat down and designed and built the widget that you know won the award or whatever it might be. So saying you're a member of a team or a member of a class or a member of a group is nice unless you can stay what you're done with it. 
So you need to be able to articulate what you done differently from that role. So for example, um, like you, if you're just going, if you're somebody going for a role in say like a bricklayer, you know, and you have to speak to a foreman who's looking to sort of add a few extra people to his crew and he's got maybe sort of 10, 15 people and he's got one position going, you know, it's going to come down to the stories and the anecdotes and sort of what you can bring through. So, you know, for example, you could say in this one would be, you know, what's a good story? Well, the job was that they're asked to say, you could say you're asked to build an extension on a small semi-attached house, which is like normal job, not, nothing big, nothing horrible. Then that's the background. So, you know, why are you different? Well, I noticed. So what was the issue crisis? You say, well, I noticed there was a missing joists above the sliding door. So as soon as you stripped away the plaster at the back, I noticed there was no joist missing. So I scraped away a bit more. Nobody told me that you're, you're then you're showing for Arkham's sake, this fictitious person is showing ingenuity. Nobody told him to do it. He scraped it away, found out there was no joist. Then the owner said that he installed the sliding door himself. So the likely result of an action, you know, well, you know, over time, you know, that will cause it to be unsafe. Uh, it'll affect the, the upper wall and possibly cause structural damage and it could fall down at the worst case scenario. So then what did you do? Well, I spoke with the customer and I spoke to the foreman. The ranger got a new joist installed and then before he started the extension. So what was the outcome? Well, after that, the customer was happy because we saved him a problem. Uh, and then he asked us to do the inside of the extension as well, rather than try it himself because he knew he did a good job and he referred us to the neighbor. That's something as simple, quote unquote, as just coming along doing, doing a part of a day, daily day job that you'd have as most builders would and doing a short extension, but you've actually explained what you done differently and what you spot and what made you stand out. I have no background in building that, I'm building by the way, I just picked it as an example to show that anything can work. Because sometimes when you say, well, what was the situation, what was the issue or the crisis or what happened, you think, well, I was on the nuclear missile test team and I spotted a uranium leak and it doesn't have to be life-saving or it doesn't have to be a major global catastrophe. It can be a small miniature crisis or a big crisis. It can be something as simple as spotting you know, a missing semicolon in 2,000 lines of code that's saved seven or eight patch and works around, which if you're a programmer, <clears throat> that's a big deal and well done to you for doing it and spotting it. Because patching obviously creates more patching when you're programming. Because the more you fix it, the more you fix it, you have to fix that line and become the snowball effect. Until you scrap it and you go out with version 1.2 of the app. So essentially, <clears throat> it doesn't have to be something that is big, or mind blowing from a external person looking at it, it has to be important from the version of your role. Now, obviously in another world, we'd sort of you know, do a bit of workshopping in groups and breakout rooms to try and come up with examples of returning to your life. We're not in that world at the moment and we're doing it virtually. So all I'll ask is <clears throat> if you do nothing else at the end of this talk and um, in the next day or two, get to the worksheet and try and pick out two or three highlights that you've done from the past that have shown you in a really good light. And real life situations in work, can be in home, it can be in volunteer positions, can be anything, it's where you've done something. And you might have been proud of yourself for finding it at the end, could be fluke, could be, it just means that at that situation, you were magnificent, one of a better word. And the thing would not have been saved, whatever it is, if you didn't take some sort of action. And use this structure to showcase exactly why it was important that you did what you did. Okay. Now, caveat being, it has to be specific to the urgency of why you saved the day. Okay. And you need to use your judgment as you know whether you need to spell it out for somebody or not. So, for example, if you're doing a HR interview and you're talking to somebody who's generally in HR and you are an engineer and you use this sort of anecdote. That's great, but you may have to explain the background of why such a thing was important because they wouldn't have an engineering background, possibly they'll have a HR background. But if you're, for example, a scientist and you're dealing with this lady who's leading the team doing the clinical work, you sort of might become across a bit insulting to try and explain in details why getting a certain bacteria, you know, result was important because she'd know it. So you have to use a bit of common sense sometimes, depending on who you're speaking with, as to whether you can handle exactly why it works or not. And it will, <clears throat> excuse me, it does help because people remember stories. And, you know, you can don't need to be able to embellish the point, you just give it factually, but it means that you're not hiding behind what happened and other people, it's you demonstrating exactly what you've done to make a change. And that is useful to 
help you stand out from there. Now, the other thing as well is when you're putting together these this little list of things where you in the past that you've worked very well or done think some good things. Um, if you have the time, and again, take from this stuff that will work for you. If you have the time, try and get at least five examples, depending how much you know life experience or work experience you have, or up to 10 really good examples where you've done things that was made you look good because you stepped outside the box and you know really, really, really innovative things or you spotted things or you made the difference. Next, we're gonna go, we'll be going back to the early questions that you'll have at interviews. So for example, um, some of the things like why you want a job or, you know, how do you handle stress? I like this, 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 have a list at the end of this, you know, there's some classic tropes that get thrown out every so often. Um, you know, if you can match some of those anecdotes and examples to common questions that could be a good answer for, then you're already starting to build up your set, your arsenal for how you'll handle the interview, okay? So it's great that somebody says, what do you like under stress? And you go, oh, I love stress. Prove it, give me an example. Oh, I used to sort of run every morning for to get to, to the bus and I only had two minutes. You know, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't say anything great. You were forced to do it. You know, but if it's a case you have a pre-existing story from real life, either again, work, can be home life, can be volunteer life, it's basically where you showed yourself above and beyond that will answer that question or help answer it, that's great to have. Then you're basically from a behavior-based interview type approach, which is becoming all the rage. Um, you're not just saying what you can do, you're demonstrating what you've done it in the past. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, one of the things from, um, you know, just for those on the call, I know there's some people from uh, transition year on the call as well. When we were doing, um, <clears throat> in some of the earlier days of CATS, we had a, per, on purpose, a approach to try and hire new grads from university because A, they weren't, um, Institution lies were working for too long in places like the HSE, so they, they were more free thinking. B, they were coachable uh, mostly, and you know we were sort of a young organization, and we used things like uh, integrated CRM systems and electronic medical records, which you know somebody who's used to the old-fashioned paperwork with fifteen admin staff for one nurse wouldn't have always been able to get a workaround. So we actively sought out um, new grads. And one of the things we noticed, you know, that from a lot of new grads is that they sometimes will fluff out their CVs with things and they might say, oh, I don't volunteer work here or I do some clinical placements there. Um, a lot of the time we would have made the judgment call whether to take somebody on or not by how they handle things either in summer jobs or volunteer times or even stuff they were doing in secondary school. It would make the difference because that sort of shows they were able to articulate and show where they make a difference over something else. And it can be sometimes as simple as somebody being trusted to open up the shop, you know, for um, the few weeks while the owner was away. And that might seem a big thing, but it tells us that <clears throat> somebody trusts them with some real assets at that young age to do something. They're dependable. Great. You know, they turn up. Right. You know, all these things are check, 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 check. But as far as the person is concerned is, you know, and I have to sort of tease it out of them because it might be the one little line on their CV where all this bump about clinical this and I got such a great score in that project, et cetera. Who cares? It doesn't matter. It's, you know, from a point of view of taking on somebody to work with, are they ticking all the intangible boxes that show they've got a good work ethic, they're trainable, coachable, et cetera. So, don't just focus on what you think you need to have in your CV. Sometimes your outside life and your richer experience will help a lot as well. Um, from another viewpoint, there was um, with ladies might be coming back to the workforce after being um, on maternity leave and then sort of leaving the workforce for a period of time with kids. You know, say, oh, I have no experience. No, you're, <laughs> you're juggling um, a family and you're getting things like there's a lot of experience you've got. You just haven't got into examples here of how you've gone yet and you bring it through. They're all transferable skills. You just don't sometimes think about the transferable skills that makes a difference. And again, knowing a bit more about the company and the play people you're going to be interviewing with helps you know which of those skills you can shout about and talk about. That makes sense for everybody? Anybody who can put your um, picture, who's not allowed to switch on your camera, just uh, <coughs> say, say yes or a thumbs up in the uh, chat box. But essentially just make sure you don't always focus on what you think should be putting into your CV. It makes a big difference. 
Um, <clears throat> lastly, if you haven't interviewed for some time, and I have sort of covered this a little bit here, um, here's a few tips if you haven't been to interview for a little while, okay? First of all, um, somebody who's fresher, less experienced, but who's got more experience of going repeat interviews, because interviews is like a pattern and coming across well, the more you do them, the better you get at them, um, can sometimes find that it's a bit tricky if you're going back into the workforce trying to find for something. Um, conversely, if you're really good at your job, there's a very good chance you've been headhunted and poached from place to place. So you may not actually have, you know, had to go out and sort of sell yourself too much <laughs> for things. And if you're in that fortunate or unfortunate position, you know, you got to realize that you may be really good if you had the role, but you're not really good at explaining to somebody who doesn't know you why you're good for the role. And you don't get like given a six month trial for places usually to try and prove yourself. Um, so you've got to be aware that you might be able to know, do the job backwards with your eyes closed, but you may not be able to get that across very easily. So the first thing I recommend if you're in this situation is um, on a purely practical basis, dust off your interview suit uh, and try them on. Um, especially if you have one, like, you know, I would have her, like, the, the interview funeral suit slash court appearance that, you know, there's no use trying them on the morning of, of it and then realizing that you're locked down has sort of made the trousers shrink or something. You know, the practical steps will always catch you up. Make sure you try it on and it's okay. Second, make sure you practice opening and closing the interview. Ask somebody, you have a friend, family member, sit across from you and just try the opening and the closing part. Um, I'm not saying so much about the middle part because if you do the stories approach and if you've got a lot of experience in your role, you'll have bucket loads of stories and situations that you're, you're coming across great. You're going to have to probably try and fine tune which ones you're going to, you're going to mention, but the initial interview, um, first impressions and the closing it out of your parts it might not work very well with. Another way, if you don't engage a family member or you're a bit embarrassed by it or you think you I don't want to go and ask my spouse to, to help me do this because I'm not going to end well. Um, then you just get your phone or a tablet or a laptop or anything. So if you're watching this now, you have a device that you'll actually be able to use. Don't stick it on um, camera mode facing you. Don't have it in selfie mode, have it in straightforward mode so the camera's facing away because you don't want to have any immediate feedback as to how you're looking. So, for example, when I'm sort of talking to you here, I see my picture down the bottom here. And if I see it's a hair out of place, I can move it back and I get immediate feedback. If you don't have that immediate visual, you're more likely to be natural. And you don't want to be trying to practice how you engage with an interview or how you make a good first impression if you're busy watching yourself on the screen below. So make sure you can see yourself and then try to put as best as possible the camera at interview, interview uh, height. So use books, use a chair, whatever to prop it up. And then just simply practice walking in, saying hi, how are you doing, etc. Greeting. That gets the first few seconds over with and helps set the right impression, especially if you're not used to doing interviews. <clears throat> it's important and it does help. Um, basically, you know, um, we found that with when say speech startups do some of the graduate um, panels, for, um, like panel interviews, is basically I don't know if they have them in all government departments, but in the, in the health service, for example. They will do a panel interview with a load of HR people, maybe one or two specialists for a role of a job title. And then when departments or clinics around the country need somebody, they'll go to that panel, take a name off and offer them the job. And the person either accepts it or doesn't and off the go. But they, in order to get onto the panel, they get offered a job, you have to go through this little process. And usually new grads who've just finished university do very well there because they're actually spending a lot of time preparing for or answer all those questions. And it's a general sort of question, like sort of like immediately leaving search style, general knowledge on the area. Whereas if somebody has worked with autism, for example, for 15, 25 years, they can answer you till you're blue in the face about ASD. But if you ask them about speech sound disorders or dysphagia, they the last look at that when they were in university back in the last century. You know, they're not going to come across very well. So be aware of that if you're going for those sort of interviews as well, that there'll be parts where you won't come across as great. And consider it like a black hole type thing in your, in your CV. You can't avoid it. You just address it head on and you just put the spin on it essentially, which is that, you know, 
this is your area of expertise, you've got the expertise in there, you shouldn't know about these other areas because then something's going pretty, uh, pretty wrong. It might be, you know, your knowledge is out of date because you haven't, you haven't kept up with it for the last while, but you're a specialist in this area and that's what you're going for. So own it and spin it. Don't try and hide behind it sometimes. Um, a quick word on online interviews, um, <clears throat> mainly because of, well, you know, the last while. Uh, you may be going for a role that's an online interview for an in-person role, in-person job. So essentially, it's a physical job. You're going to go off and drive or get the bus there when you do the job. Or you could be doing an online interview for a job that will be done remotely. So the, either way, how you prepare for the interview and what you do is the exact same. So here's a few things. Um, <clears throat> you can prepare better for a start. So you can make sure you're sitting in the right clothes you'll be using for the interview in the actual location you're doing the interview, using the actual equipment you're doing the interview. If you have enough notice, make sure you set up and do a dry run, like even use Zoom like this and record it, use a record function at the same time of day that your interview is at. So you can see and control exactly how your impression is and how you come across. Make sure the light's good for you. So <clears throat> if you have a, a room, then you can use virtual backgrounds if you like, but basically, if you're having a room, make sure that you have a light on that can't see off the camera there. So you have as much light behind you as possible. And borrow a lamp or get a lamp and stick it to the left or to the right, depends on which is a good side, just off your screen there. And the reason there is that you, <clears throat> excuse me, the more light behind you creates depth. The light here shines on you, so it makes you shine up better. And um, that has the effect of the autofocus on your machine, but then realize, there's nothing behind. The thing I have to focus on is here. And then if you move forward or back or you go around the place or whatever, it'll be able to keep track of it better. If you use virtual background and you don't have a green screen or you're not next to a wall, it can sometimes get a bit blurry and it's hard to see. A, if you're going to go for an in-person job, but you're doing the interview remotely, it's not such a big importance and it's you no, know, it's all right to have. But if you're going for a role that could be done remotely, this is essentially the prospective employer seeing how they'll be interacting with you on a daily basis. And it's a dry run for them as to how you'll be working online. So also check your internet connection is good enough. Switch off your router about 30 minutes beforehand. So it's had a chance to reestablish the IP address and have a fresh connection. And it's, it's just unfortunate a case, but if you're going for a job that's working from home, your connection and how well you come across going to be a reflection of how well you can work from there and how well you can represent their company from there. And if it's a work from home type role, it might be great. You can be sitting back in your house, wherever you are in the country. Just remember the pool of talent that that employer has available is no longer within walking distance of their head office. It's nat national, definitely European, possibly worldwide, depending on their organization. So, you know, from there, you have a you have to be sure exactly that you go for the right sort of role that you'll work with. And when it sort of comes to keeping head of the game there, if that's the sort of job you're going for, professional development, continuous learning, CPD, getting the certs under your belt, upskilling, all makes you stand out in the global marketplace for the sort of jobs that you want to do working from home. And work from home jobs are very important for people who may want to have flexible work life balance. And that's a lot while we're covering on the how to get the best to work from home talk this day next week. Um, same bad time, same bad channel, but it's important because it's the world of work that's moving to. And for a lot of people who would be under 30 on the call, you're going to be, this is going to be the work life you're going to be having down the line. So it's good to start embracing it and be ahead of the curve because if you're not on top of the wave and surfing the wave, you're sort of blah, 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 under the wave. But don't go overboard either. Use what you have. Don't go out and buy expensive equipment. Don't go and sort of rejig everything or sort of borrow someone's laptop to try and do it or other things. Just use what you can and make sure that you, ha you have it set well. Just have the basics. Reset your connection. Make sure you have lights on and that you let your system do its thing with autofocus. And then all the rest, you just simply focus on your stories, anecdotes, etc., and go from there. So that's the uh, slight um, detour about working from home and uh, trying to do online interviews. But for the time being, probably a lot of interviews will be done online as well, at least till the end of the year, possibly even the next year, depending on what it is. But 
the work from home movement has had a kickstart of about 10, 10, 15 years dragged forward because of COVID. So there will be a lot more roles coming up that will be expertise specific, but location agnostic that will be open for grabs for those who are willing to take it. So on the day, on the day of your interview, um, this is some basic stuff. Eat something light beforehand. You forget that. Eat something light beforehand. I don't mean sit down to a nice big burger and chips, something light, banana, you know, snack, not chocolate to give yourself a sugar rush. It might be great, but you might just come across a bit manic. Just so make sure that you get rid of your basics. Um, review the application, <clears throat> excuse me. Review the application that you submitted quickly. Make sure you're aware of it. Um, again, you need to make sure that you know what you've sent in and what they're going to be talking about. Try and arrive about 10, 15 minutes early. Um, and remember, the minute you leave, this is again, normal going meeting people interviews, okay? The minute you leave for the interview, you are being interviewed. Get that in your head. Think along these lines. If you're walking down the road to the building and you pass some people outside having a smoke break or something in the sun or whatever, you can't assume that they are just nothing. They could be somebody who'll know somebody they would be interviewing or could even be one of the interviewers taking a break. At reception, the same thing. Treat everybody you meet as somebody whose opinion you could be asked for about, uh, could be asked about at the afterwards. If you're going, for example, for a role in a garage forecourt, something you have to pass a team, the existing team doing stuff, be aware they'll be clocking you, you might be clocking them. Somebody's gonna ask at the end how it might be. And it can just be something simple. You know, if it's all equal and there's four or five very equal candidates, people are people. Are people and sometimes something simple can sway somebody one way or the other. So it's just make sure you have performance mode on from the minute you leave for the interview. And that said, make sure you breathe, okay? So this is a very quick, trick, it's a blender of mindfulness and cognitive behavioral therapy of a suggestion that will help, okay? <clears throat> now it helps for any sort of uh, change of mode or it helps for when you are on the spot or you're getting stuck or something's an issue or a situation gets stressful. When things go a bit pear-shaped, our brains can really mess us up. The thoughts start running away and you step away, you feel yourself stepping away from the, from the situation and going, oh God, oh God, what's gonna happen, oh no. This is simply a quick five, 10 second tip. So it's very simply that you check in with yourself that what you can see, hear, smell, touch, and taste. Right now, I've got the order wrong, sorry, I just, I just see my own slide. Um, right now, and only focus on those for say 10, 20 seconds. So one of the things I used to um, tell the, our therapy team, um, sometimes if they'd have sessions that run over, um, usually if it ends on time, it's great. But if there's a, uh, if the parents been given bad news and they're in tears, you're not going to kick them out because it's a quarter to two. You, you let it go and you sort of gently at the door. So sometimes it might be finishing at literally a minute to two and the next one's walking in at two o'clock and it's had this big, oh, situation. Um, this is one of the things that used to help them. I asked them to sort of make sure they're aware to try and do before the new person walks through because A, it's not the new person, the new client's fault that somebody else had a really bad experience and has just been given really bad news by you, but you can't also have your head in that space because then you won't be doing your best for the client walking through. It's tough, but that's the way you have to do it to give the best to people. So it's simply as a way to disconnect and try and reset. It's you do a quick check-in. You can do it anywhere, anytime, not when you're driving. That said, apart from driving or in charge of heavy vehicles or airplanes or mechanical diggers, but for the most part, you can do this in any sort of time as a way as a quick check-in. So if you're sitting down and you're just about to walk into the interview or you get called for it, you know, just take a quick check-in, what you can see, feel, smell, taste, and touch right there. And only focus on that for a couple of seconds. It gives a chance of de-wetting your brain and your runaway thoughts, especially if you're trying to go through possible answers or scenarios or how you'll answer things. The aim is that when you walk in, you're able to be fully present in the moment and answer the questions and be yourself, okay? Um, it's like if you're going to do an ex if you're back when you're doing exams, you're going to sort of, you try and cram everything the night before the exam. That's okay, it can help health, but if you're able to be present at the time of your exam, you won't let your subconscious brain bring this information to the front. 
This is a chance of grounding you and stopping your brain running off. So you think of your thoughts like clouds or little train cars going back and forth. You know, you're very easy to start following them and then suddenly your brain's going. The more the emotional distress increases, the faster your brain goes and it's harder to try and focus. So this is a way to snap yourself out of it. So that's the starting point. Um, help ground yourself. When you're doing the interview yourself, don't think of it like as an interview, as in person up there, you down here being interviewed. It's a negotiation and it's a discussion. So you should be, regardless of your stage in your career, the mindset to have is you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. You are selling life, basically. So you are selling chunks of your life, which is a finite amount, to them in return for money or whatever else, okay? So it's not a case that you have to take what they give. You need to make sure that you are happy enough that there's a nice place for the work for you and you can get the right feeling from them, okay? It's not like the potential employer is a choosing a sweet shop. You have to be a good fit for them just as much as they have to be a good fit for you because it, you'll spend a lot of time at work. You need to make sure you're happy at work as much as you possibly can, okay? So going with that impression and with that mindset, here's some things that you can, you know, and this is stuff which is, is this is the, um, tropes you hear a lot. So I'm going to quickly go through some of these because most people have heard of these. Body language, first few seconds are very important. A good interviewer will try to put you at ease, but the onus is on yourself to make the best impression normally. But good ones will try and make you, you know, try and be nice about it, make things easy for you. Eye contact is important, so make sure you keep eye, eye to eye contact with everybody as you introduce themselves. Again, I don't need to say it, but I, I will say it. Posture is important. Don't slouch and um, try and sit comfortably. And imagine yourself like on a standby mode or ready between the readiness and alertness. Okay. You're not going to be hyper bouncing up and down, ready to answer questions. You shouldn't be looking like you would have a nap. Just be quiet, calm, and assertive. Okay. The first few minutes are going to give you usually a chance at the flavor of them and they get a flavor of you. And it's a great opportunity to use one of your ready-made your story examples. Okay. So the best interviews usually are conversations, not questions and answers. So if the interviewer is feeling relaxed with you or the interviewers are feeling more relaxed with you, they'll have a better final impression as well. And that will give you more opportunity to just elaborate on the pre-prepared stories you have. So you're great. Okay. Now, there will be some usual questions to be prepared for. Like these, <clears throat> here's some questions you can use maybe maybe straightforward like what are you like under pressure or what's your best trait there's quite lazy interviews or a behavior-based interviewer you'll notice because they'll say describe a time you're under a lot of pressure at work how did you react you know so they'll ask you for more information um in both whatever way it is just be prepared to use your stories and answering them okay now there's loads of these questions tell me about yourself how you describe yourself what makes you unique when you work here blah, blah, blah. i'm not going to go to all these because Google is your best friend. There are some links. Knock yourself out preparing for set interview questions if you like. You may be lucky and they'll have something. They may not. End of the day, have your core set of stories for how you shine is going to get you out of most of these, whatever questions people throw at you. But the general ones, you'll find they're of, of, of use. So grab the links and have a look at them afterwards. It's in the handout because they're the legal questions you can look them up all the time. Well, I do need to spend time on those, this one. And this is the important part, especially if um, anybody here is um, sort of uh, in university level or secondary school level on this, you need to be aware of this part of it, the legal questions. I don't mean where can you score some drugs down the, by the canal or anything else, nothing that illegal. It's the illegal questions that they shouldn't be asking you. And I'm gonna cover what they are. And I'm gonna quickly explain how they can ask these questions without asking the questions and what you can do about it. So these are no-nos. No explicit, uh, explicit, sorry, explicit or implicit questions on race, color, sex, religion, national origin, birthplace, age, disability, or marital family status. No, it not to do with the price of cabbage. They're not allowed by law to ask those questions. So the question that you need to be aware of if you get asked something is to try and realize is it accidental or intentional 
or were they implying the question? So, um, accidental or intentional is like this. If the interviewer might ask a question about one of these things, without realizing it. So you could be having a great conversation and you've got their, you've got the, 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 their your mojos going, you've got, the, you've got the angle of them, they were getting you, and it's no longer an interview, it's a discussion, it's a meeting, and you're getting on great. And they might inadvertently mention something about what their spouse does or doesn't do that annoys them, ha, ha, ha. And then they might ask you, you know, do you hide the same? They've inadvertently asked you, do you have a spouse if you're married? Um, now, again, you have to be the adult here and use your own judgment. You know, it might be just unintentional and it could be a judgment call. Um, if it's something you're happy in answering, fine. If it's not, you just try and give a non-polite, non-committal answer, okay? Um, if it's a case that you feel it's intentional or you get uncomfortable, you can just refuse to answer or say it rather on state. End of the day, if there's some hidden bias that's going to affect you, then it can be hard to call at the time, but you really are better off not there, okay? So it may be that they're having a discussion with something and the way they ask a question will sort of force your hand at something, but it's down to your own judgment as to whether you think they were trying to do it or not. Usually if you give a non-committal answer at the start or you dodge it and the same type of thing comes back again in some shape or form, then they're actually trying to angle around it. Normally there's a, I won't say valid reason, there may be a historical reason why you might answer that certain, ask that certain question and that's fair enough but it's not a way to actually sort of answer outright or to be grudge or the grudge wrong word, prejudice you for going for a job because you may have a marital status or something that they're not really happy about or that they'd rather not. The other one is implying the question. If they say, oh, I always find it tricky to get myself on time into work because um, after school drop-offs, you know, you know, it's really hard. How do you find that, you know, that's again, it's implying the question again. So, this would be a type of trying to ask about your family status without sort of asking outright. So if you say, oh, not a problem, young, free and single, you're answering it. Or if you answer the question, yeah, yeah, my kids drop off it's half an hour earlier, I can be there on time, you're also answering it. Um, you can give like an I can imagine or I can see, you know, it can be empathetic with the answer. But basically, if you think they're trying to find out something that they shouldn't know, you have the right to end the interview, refuse to answer, okay? So if, for example, the underlying issue is people are late turning up for work to open the shop for argument's sake. You know, that's the question they should ask. So if you don't want to dodge a question, you don't feel comfortable answering it, you know, see beyond what they're trying to wrap it up as and say, well, you know, I'm you know, happy enough to be there at sort of 8.30 to, ask, to open for 9.45 every morning because I can drive in it. So you, you give the reasons and examples why I can do it. But just be careful if there's a question around these areas, you're not allowed to ask. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Because not everybody's aware that they can't be, that you're not supposed to be asked outright and people aren't stupid. They won't ask you outright. They'll try either intentionally, uh, they might sort of imply the question or they might accidentally drop something that will force you to say what it is. And then it's just down to you in both situations to be the adult and work out how to respond. We don't have to respond directly. But a good rule of thumb, again, is if they come back to it a second or third time, that's pretty much they say that they have an issue with it they want to ask. Some tips to keep in mind generally. Um, again, apologies if you already know these. Um, no negativity about a previous employer or job. Don't discuss about benefits, vacations, or pay in the first interview anyway. If you're going for a second or third interview and they get to talk turkey as they introduce it, that's fine. Um, on professional language, goes without saying. Um, you know, uh, if the interviewer drops in the word shit or something into the interview, that does not give you car plans to respond in the same vernacular. Um, just, just keep professional on. Um, asking what the company does, um, you should know that already. And just stay away from the cliches like, oh, what's your worst trait? I'm too perfectionist. I know. Or I'm always on time. No, just see it coming a mile away. Ignore those things. Okay, so if you have as well a just lack of experience, don't get into a discussion about it, okay? Um, call a spade a spade. If you don't have um, lack, you don't have a lot of experience on your belt, what you do have is, hopefully, anyway, enthusiasm, enthusiasm, coachability, and that means basically being willing to learn. And if you can demonstrate areas where you're willing to learn, that's great because 
every single person sitting on one side of an interview table at one stage or the other side of the interview table. And unless you're being a complete moron about it or you're being a bit vindictive, um, you will get that. And as I said, a good interviewer will usually try and make you feel at ease and to make it easy as possible for you to have a good conversation because they want to know as much about you as possible so they can make an informed choice. Some good questions to have ready to ask. Um, what do you expect from this position? The reason why I'm saying that is they can have a title, they have a quick job description, etc. But usually this is a chance to say, well, how do they expect the person, the ideal person to run this position? You can have, it's like an actor and there being no small roles, only small actors, okay? Because there's nobody, there's only one you, this is a way to say exactly, you know, what do they want the person to bring? And then that'll help you chance to sort of explain how you can bring some of this to what they want to do. Um, what those expectations change over time. So it may be that they've taken on a role and it's possible that, that role may be changing or moving or merging or something in future. You need to be aware of that at the start. At the start. And then what's the typical work they like? What do you see the company in five years? What are the next steps? Yada, yada. They're good ones to have ready to ask. If you have nothing else that you that you're from the end of the discussion that you really want to ask from the advanced or your questions or whatever, they're good handy ones to have ready to go to go from there. Okay. Um, and the typical workday one's actually quite a nice one because it gives you an indication what the place is like to work there and you can help try and visualize working there. It gives you a bit of the insight into the behind the scenes, if they're honest with you. And lastly, try and end on a positive note. So you're going to want to plan how you want the interview to end, okay? So you're going to be given a chance to ask your questions. So wrapping it up is in your control. And make sure you leave the summary or the thank you that you can give easily. So you make sure that you've got a final one or two takeaways that you can give people that they can walk away with that will leave you in a good impression, okay? And make sure that you thank each person for giving you the time for the meeting in the first place. Not many people do that. And it is something that sometimes leaves quite, and it can be the only one standing out if there's only two or three people what to thank the interviewers, it stands out. Lastly, now, um, this is the what went well and take a look at. So it's as soon as it's safe, by the way, not in the coffee shop across the road or sitting downstairs in reception. Even if you go back home or whatever, okay, you sit down and you work out exactly what went well, what did not go so well. If there's any questions you're asked that you got stuck on. If there was a story that you, uh, had ready to go and you basically, it bombed and it didn't have the impact you thought it would. Go try and think back, what did you use the wrong example at the wrong time or something you do differently? So just replay the interview in your head and work out on one side of the sheet, page, piece of paper, what went well and what things you need to look back at again. And it's important to focus on the things that went well because sometimes if you only focus on the negatives, you're gonna might forget the things you need to reinforce that goes well for you. It also helps you prepare for it the next time. And by the way, also remember that this is your thoughts about how you went. You might think you flunked it, but the interviewers could be very impressed. Okay, so you, you, you may have known people or you may have had it yourself or you thought you could be utterly dived in an interview, but you get the job. Or you think the interview went brilliantly and then you're astounded when you don't get the job. You know, it's only your impression. All you can do is write down how you think things went. But doing that after each time, and then when you've done a number of interviews, because practice makes perfect, you'll see that might be sort of key things sticking out that you think are going well each time, but it's been it's um, falling down on you and you focus on those areas or vice versa. But let's make this part of the process. This will help you refine it for each step you go towards. And in a quick checklist you can use, again, this is in the um, the handbook at the end. Um, just simple stuff, were you on time? Were you dressed appropriate? Did the opening go well? Use many stories. Just simply go down those and just check yes or no or things you want to work on. Um, you know, and one of the ones there near the end is, did you convey at least one thing the interviewer should remember about you? So if you think about you being a number of people that interviewed in that day, what, when they're going through all the names and they come across your name, what's the one key thing or story or outcome that you want the interviewers to think, yep, that's her, she had the story or she done this or whatever. And make sure that's one of the last things that we've mentioning when you do your summary at the end as well. So 
succeeding sometimes does takes a bit of practice and persistence. So the more effort you put into the preparation, the better it will be, which is why sometimes those who may be on the job hunt a lot will sometimes come across very well in interviews when somebody who's in a current role who maybe go for a job once in the blue moon when the position comes up may struggle and may come across a bit well. So it is a method whereby persistence does pay off. But if you're in the case whereby you're going for targeted jobs that as they arise infrequently, just you know, own the fact that you don't go for jobs very often. And that you know, you've been years since your last interview, put some of these that you know that you've normally you've either been promoted from within, positive, poached, positive, you've um, grown your role, positive, you, know, you haven't needed to go for positions elsewhere. And that's why you're a bit rusty. Own it and go from there. So that's it. So there's a small handout and worksheets that go with this talk, which you can get a copy of by going to my Facebook group, which the link is appearing on screen now, and it'll also be on the comment section beneath this video. And click on the group, join up, and you can get a copy of the worksheet, which will have some of the steps that we've covered, as well as some worksheets that you can go through as you're preparing for interviews for yourself in the future. Don't think of it as a, think of it more like a performance, and for want of a better word. Um, the advantage you have for online interviews is you can see exactly how you're gonna be coming across. So use the record function on your video camera, on your device. Um, what sometimes works is you use post-it notes and stick them on the top. So when I do, um, when I do sort of like Facebook videos or things, I have to just keep a few key points. I have it going around the side of the screen with the notes. Um, Sometimes I will have it in a Word document or something on the system. The problem there is sometimes if the screen is trying to try and chat back and forth, it can jump on it. But post-it notes with the key points is usually a pretty good way to do it. Um, if you feel that you need to have those there to do that, you do it. But you need to make sure that you're able to quickly glance off up and down and not be sort of seen to be looking at an answer to the question. Uh, but it's, it's, the same, it's the same thing. You, no, nobody has to see what you have in front of you. You you can control the environment with an online interview. That's what I'm, but people don't spend the time actually because it's, it's a bit self conscious sitting down and trying to sort of go and do something, you know, and then record yourself. Um, but that's how people will be seeing you. And it's we're, we're so used to jumping onto Zoom calls and stuff now that you don't always realize that you know it's it make the difference. If you if it's a job you want and it's going to affect you or your family's life or more income or a different banding or whatever. Um, it's worth putting like half an hour or so into to make sure you come across well because you only have a short period of time to do it. And especially if it's a job where you'll be expected to use that same place um, in the role, you know, show off the best impression you possibly can that way. Bring the meeting to a close. And thanks everybody for coming along. Thank and you. And have a nice rest of your day. Bye bye. Yeah.